Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into things. A podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 16 of Insights into Tomorrow, Microsoft's Gaming Monopoly. I'm your host today, Sam Whalen, and my co-host, Joseph Whalen. How are you doing today? Doing good, Sam. How are you doing today? Fantastic. We've uh, taken a long hiatus from the show. Uh, <laughs> the holiday break became the almost Q1 of 2022 breaks. <laughs> but we're back. We're back, and we're talking about the Microsoft acquisition of Activision and Blizzard. Uh, we're going to break it all down for you. Uh, on today's episode. But really quick, just a quick summary at the top of the show. So on January the 18th, uh, we're a little bit late on this, but yesterday's news are tomorrow's insights. Uh, <laughs> January the 18th, 2022, Microsoft, uh, you guys may know them from Xbox and from computers, uh, announced that they were acquiring Activision Blizzard in an all-cash transaction valued at $68.7 billion, or $95 per share. Now, this is arguably the biggest piece of news in the history of the games industry, uh, and on today's show, we're going to take a look at what this means, why the acquisition is so important, and uh, honestly, why you should care, because you might you know, look at this news and say, well, how does this affect me? It might not, but we'll get into it regardless. Uh, in addition, we'll hit some key elements, <coughs> excuse me, some key elements that should be remembered in this conversation going forward. Uh, but before we get into all that, I want to remind you some show plugs. We, you can subscribe to this podcast and all the podcasts offered from Insights into Things. Uh, we're on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, and Pandora. Uh, I know Spotify just introduced a five-star rating system. Uh, so if you can go in there and rate the podcast, it does help our numbers quite a bit. Uh, in terms of contact information, we can be emailed at con uh, comments at insightsintothings.com. Twitter, we are at insights underscore things. Uh, Facebook, you can just search insights into things podcast. Instagram, at insights into things. And finally, all these links, as well as more information, are on our website, www.insightsintothings.com. But that's all the housekeeping for today. Let's get right into the program. All right, so starting off with what exactly happened here. Now we have the press release from Microsoft that I've pulled a couple excerpts from just because nobody wants to hear boring corporate speak. <laughs> um, but I've kind of boiled it down here. So, quote, Microsoft will acquire Activision Blizzard for $95 per share, which we hit at the top of the show, a $68.7 billion purchase, uh, inclusive of Activision's Blizzard's net cash. Now, when the, this transaction closes, Microsoft will become the world's third largest gaming company by revenue, uh, and they are behind Tencent at number one. Uh, Tencent, if you don't know, is a mobile game company. They're out of China. Uh, they make a ton of money through mobile games. And, of course, Sony at number two, Sony being the main competitor uh, of Microsoft. Now, the planned acquisition includes iconic franchises from the Activision Blizzard uh, and King Studios, uh, King being the makers of Candy Crush, uh, but games like Warcraft, uh, whether that be World of Warcraft or... Th is there another Warcraft game? <laughs> Yeah, there's a whole series of different Warcraft games that are yeah. really Yeah, uh, Diablo, Overwatch, Call of Duty, which Call of Duty is a big one that we'll come back to, uh, and if, like I said, Candy Crush. Uh, in addition to the global esports activities through MLG, uh, or Major League Gaming, which is one of the biggest uh, esports, I don't know, what would you call them, producers? Uh, yeah, organizers, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the company has studios around the world with nearly 10,000 employees. Now, if we can see... We have a there's a graphic you can look up. We have it on the this back monitor here, um, <clears throat> but some other studios included are Treyarch, Raven, High Moon, uh, Beanox, Infinity Ward, uh, Toys for Bob, which makes remakes mostly. But it's more than just you know these big games here. These are your big things, uh, your Overwatches, your Call of Duties, um, which we'll hit on more in uh, later on in the show. But it's important to remember just how many studios are being acquired uh, now under the Microsoft banner. 
uh, that you may not even think of. Um, but some important points, uh, actually, before we get into that, uh, Joe, what do you think about this acquisition when you see these big studios? Do any of these games jump out to you? Well, obviously, some of them do. I mean, we, we've got Call of Duty, we've got Diablo, we've got World of Warcraft that's a little little long in the tooth right now, but it's a huge franchise. Um, it, one thing that is important to emphasize is this, the deal is still pending regulation, regulator approval. Yep. So it isn't a done deal just yet. So I think it's it's important to point that out. Um, <clears throat> I think it's it's definitely a huge deal as far as dollar value and the impact of the industry. I don't think it's game breaking just yet. I, I think we kind of have, assuming it goes through, you've got probably about three years or more before it starts having a huge impact because of existing uh, contracts and, and rights yeah. management that, that's going on. Yeah, definitely. And I think the I think there's a special task force. Not well, task force is a bit dramatic, but <laughs> there's a there's a FTC uh, group being assembled specifically to look into this to make sure that it's all you know it's all square before this acquisition goes yeah. through. So it is still pending, um, but it's most likely going to happen. <laughs> So we thought we'd cover it today. Uh, but some more important points for you. Like I said, Microsoft now becomes, or will become, once this, if this goes through, will become the third largest gaming company by revenue. Uh, just to put that into perspective, oh, I was wrong. Sony's number one uh, at, with gaming revenue at $25 billion. Tencent coming in at number two with $13.9 billion. Uh, Nintendo was number three with $12.1 billion, but Microsoft has knocked them out with uh, $11.6 billion, which, you know, those numbers don't make sense. None of them looking at them. <laughs> But Microsoft will be taking that third spot for revenue. I imagine those numbers will probably go up for them now that they have acquired all these big franchises. Uh, speaking of those franchises, especially Call of Duty. Call of Duty is one of the biggest things they're getting out of this. Uh, Activision isn't publishing a whole lot now, but it's primarily a Call of Duty machine. Uh, but we'll get back to Call of Duty. No, I'm sure that wasn't important, whatever that was. <laughs> oh, not at all. We'll get back to Call of Duty later on because it is something that I think deserves its own segment just because of how much money they're going to be making off it. Uh, but and another important note is that King, uh, King, the development studio, the Candy Crush people, uh, gives Microsoft a big foot in the mobile gaming market, uh, which they didn't really have before. They have their xCloud, which they're allowing you to play Xbox games on your phones. But in terms of games specifically developed for mobile, Microsoft didn't really have something like that, uh, except for, you know, there was a, what, Spartan Assault. There was a couple Halo games that were... They're not even worth mentioning. Yeah. Really. Yeah, which you can also play on console now anyway. Uh, but it's where Tencent dominates, so we're going to see if, you know, Microsoft acquiring this, are they going to try to go after Tencent in that mobile gaming market? Um, but yeah, this is the broad umbrella look at it. This is the kind of the big overview. We'll get into some of the details in just a bit. Uh, but were there any thoughts you wanted to add, just big picture, about this acquisition? Yeah, I mean, consolidation in the game industry really isn't new, and that's what a lot of people are concerned about with this. You know, for the past four or five years, we've seen gaming studios gobble each other up. You know, left and right, Epic acquired Tonic in 2021. EA went on its own buying spree, picking up BioWare and all the other known studios in the last, you know, five to six years. What's significant with Microsoft is that they're not just a game studio. Mm -hmm. They're a platform and a hardware manufacturer. So that's, that's what's got a lot of people concerned is that they can lock up a lot of exclusives with this. Yeah, exactly. But even the exclusives aren't that concerning because Sony's had exclusives you know, for decades now, you know, their, their entire intellectual property. <clears throat> when um, <clears throat> Sega liquidated their Dreamcast and their gaming systems, they basically sold off their intellectual property to Microsoft. They divided it between Microsoft and, and Sony and each got a couple of pieces of that property. Um, but like I said before, the, the deal's full impact won't be felt for a few years because of, of a number of existing licensing agreements. And, you know, a lot can change in three or four years in the gaming industry. That's true. Yeah, you're going to see these, these studios shift. Uh, I mean, a lot of these studios have big games waiting to come out. You know, we have Overwatch 2. Overwatch 1 coming out in 2016. We've yet to see. We've seen a ton of gameplay of Overwatch 2. But it's kind of one of those ones that Blizzard has in their back pocket that they're kind of just waiting to drop. Probably a guaranteed hit because, you know, the Overwatch. I'm part of the Overwatch fan base. It's a it's a big uh a big fan base, but we're, we're hoping to see that soon uh, with this acquisition as well. Uh, but let's get, uh, we'll take a short break. We'll come back and get into the nitty gritty details. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. 
Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back, everyone, to episode 16 of Insights Into Tomorrow, where today we're talking about the Microsoft acquisition of Activision and Blizzard. So getting into the details here, Activision Blizzard has been making some questionable management decisions in the last few years. And this is something I wanted to put right at the top, uh, just so we can kind of get it out of the way, because it is uh, there is some controversy there that I think is worth talking about. Uh, mainly from Bobby Kotick, the Activision Blizzard uh, Incorporated Chief Executive Officer or CEO, uh, this is from Bloomberg, from uh, Devon Pendleton and Scott Carpenter. Uh, Activision CEO is looking at a $375 million payout in the Microsoft sale. Uh, so Bobby Kotick will be getting his uh, his payout from this, and we'll get into sort of his behavior and why that is uh, controversial, <laughs> I think. Uh, last year, Activision Blizzard Inc. Uh, Chief Executive uh, Kotick, he received a 50% pay cut uh, this year, he's up for a $375.3 million windfall before taxes. Now, Kotick's time as CEO has been marked by a leader whose recent tenure has been marked... Or, I just repeated myself in the notes here. Um, but his tenure has been marked by employee complaints over sexism, uh, a hostile work culture, and mismanagement of assault claims. And that's kind of the big thing here, uh, why he's kind of had a negative light on him pretty much his entire time at Activision as CEO. Uh, as recently as November, he was a target of employee walkouts and petitions demanding his removal over reports he failed to make the company's board aware of allegations of rape and other serious misconduct. Uh, now, since being CEO in 2017, Kotick owns almost 4 million shares of Activision. Uh, this is the most of any officer or director, according to their filings. The second largest holder is board chairman Brian Kelly, who owns 1.4 million through trust and foundations, which his stake is at a value of 137 million uh, based on this deal. So that's where a lot of this money is coming from. Now, were you aware of um, of Bobby Kotick at all, just from any kind of press you might have heard about? Him? I don't know how you could not have been yeah. with all the all the negative press that he had. Yeah, uh, when the deal itself cut. Um, it was interesting. The companies have been kind of playing the fate of Kotick a little loose, a little close mm -hmm. to the vest. Um, they only said that he's going to remain CEO through the 2023 fiscal year for Microsoft, uh, which ends June 30th, 2023. What is interesting, he he's quoted himself saying is he'll be available if needed. Right. <laughs> and I don't think he's going to get too many callbacks. No. But even if he doesn't, in addition to the stock buyout that he gets, he has an employment contract that entitles him to a severance package worth $293 million should he lose his job as a result of a corporate takeover. So this guy's walking away with well over half a million, half a billion dollars as a result of this. Yeah, and that's one of the things you kind of hate to see come out of this, right? When we, we get into that discussion of corporate consolidation is that, you know, the, the bad guys that float to the top often get away, you know, arguably better off than they were before, yeah. uh, if they're going at all, even. Uh, you know, Microsoft, like you had said, were very wishy-washy about it because that was one of the things, you know, you think, oh, great acquisition. Okay, what happens with Bobby Kotick? Are we getting this guy out of here? Right. Because it's, it's, it's something that's pretty much universally agreed upon is that he is not a great manager and, you know, these, these sexual assault allegations and employee walkouts, the hits just kept coming. And it was, you know... It's an interesting decision for Microsoft to say, okay, we're going to keep the guy around, but is that because we don't want to have to pay out $250 million? Right, exactly. Uh, but Kotick's compensation was controversial even before California's Department of Fair Employment and Housing sued the video game publisher in July, detailing a retaliatory, quote, frat boy culture. Earlier, the company announced it was slashing Kotick's 2021 salary and bonus uh, in half in response to criticism. Uh, his pay package was excessively lavish <laughs> compared with his peers. Uh, a Kotick was also found in Jeffrey Epstein's black book, uh, in which he used his company email address. Uh, and that's yeah, not a that, great look. That, that doesn't help you or the company at that point. No, I mean, it's, it's yeah, because 
I don't know why you would use your company email address. The hubris. I don't know why you'd be involved with him in the first place. True, yeah. Um, but that's just one of the issues with Activision Blizzard. There are other problems as well in terms of union busting. Uh, this comes from Ethan Gank. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Ethan, from Kotaku. Uh, Call of Duty Maker reveals plan to squash union effort. Activision Blizzard calls for a studio-wide vote after refusing to voluntarily recognize Raven QA Union. Now, Raven is one of the studios uh, under Activision Blizzard acquired in this acquisition. Um, but this comes from the Kotaku article, quote, 34 staff from Raven's QA department revealed recently that they were organizing with the Communications Workers of America to unionize, uh, which would, would have been an unprecedented step for developers at a major gaming company. They called on Activision Blizzard to voluntarily recognize the union, which had supermajority uh, support within the QA department. Now, this is where we get into company policy from Blizzard. Uh, their policy essentially boils down to when a company refuses to voluntarily recognize the union, the organizers behind it must win a majority in an election ratified by the National Labor Review Board. Now, this would be a huge hurdle for the folks over at Raven. Uh, that would have been, uh, sorry, a hurdle that would have been easy for Game Workers Alliance to overcome within just the QA department because you have a very small section of employees would have been very easy to get a majority. By requiring all employees at Raven to have a say, Activision Blizzard is effectively arguing that either the entire studio, not just the QA department, but the whole studio of Raven, unionize or no one does. And that's kind of where you get into these these uh, wordsmith sort of, you know, how we're going to use technicalities to, to kind of break up these unions. How do you feel about that? Well, I think that's one of those things where, one, you're not going to you're not going to win against the union at this point in time. All mm -hmm. these. I mean, if, if Amazon itself is fighting against the unionization of their facilities and losing, yeah. Blizzard's not going to win. And second, if you're trying to force the entire company to unionize rather than just a department, you're shooting yourself in the foot right there. Because all you're going to do is piss off all your employees, yeah. then they're all going to unionize, and then you're really screwed yeah. in the end. Yeah, but uh, Blizzard had another response to this. This comes from Nicole Carpenter over at Polygon. Uh, the situation developed even more back in November. Quote, uh, this is from a company statement. Uh, in November, we began the process to convert our temporary employees to full-time employment status. Uh, this comes from Raven Software Studio head Brian Raffle uh, in an email to staff. Uh, he goes on to say, Now, I'm excited to share that our QA colleagues will embed directly within various teams across the studio, including animation, art, design, audio, production, and engineering. In the email, Raffle said, The move to our embed, our QA team has been in the works for several months. Now, this splitting up of the QA team that was trying to unionize comes just six weeks after they were or they were coming off a six week work strike. Uh, this makes unionization even more difficult. So these folks go on strike for the union. They come back. And the QA department is split up among all different parts of Raven, making it even more difficult to effectively unionize. Do you think, you know, according to to Raffle here from Raven, they say this was in the works for several months. Do you buy that, or do you, is this a little too much of a coincidence for you? I There's probably a grain of truth in there because these guys, as monumental as some of the mistakes are that they're making, they're not stupid. Right. And when they started getting whispers that the QA department was going to unionize, the first way to do that is to liquidate your QA department and dissolve it into everyone else who's not going to unionize. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there was probably plans for it. I think the strike forced their hand and required them to to basically pull the trigger on that decision. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they had much of a choice there. Yeah, and this, you know, as we're kind of alluding to here, this the timing of these events is certainly interesting. Is the speculation is that is this acquisition of Microsoft purchasing Blizzard, you know, with the gip hype moments of having all these franchises come to Microsoft, is that meant to overshadow the the uh, the bad PR that Activision Blizzard has been getting for like five years now. Pretty much everything. There was even the thing with Blizzard. I don't know if I have it in the notes here, but where the controversy with China, where they were censoring the Hearthstone player yeah. when they was protesting China, and that was like huge news for like weeks, and yeah. it was all negative PR for Blizzard. And you know, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes you have to wonder, you know, the CEO or the higher ups over at Microsoft, was there a thought of, you know, is this too many bad apples? Is this is this too much of a bad PR move? And I think there's little doubt that Microsoft is buying damaged goods, yeah. you know, as far as the reputation of the company goes. The products they put out are solid. Microsoft's already looking to do damage control on the bad image. Uh, I had found a uh, Wall Street Journal article um, where Sabina Menchel, who's the president of Global Investigative 
firm Nardello and Company, says there's definitely more diligence being done, particularly diligence being done around bad behavior on the part of Microsoft doing their due diligence. She said not only uh, sexual harassment or misconduct, but bullying and other types of behavior, companies are a lot less tolerant. Microsoft being that. Microsoft knows that they're going to get a lot of uh, press and attention. Um, and they realize that their own reputation is on the line here. So the last thing a company like Microsoft wants is to inject itself with a cancerously bad culture uh, that will eat away at the rest of the company. Um or, you know, certainly more company profits than anything else. So Microsoft's not stupid in this acquisition. They kind of knew what they were getting, which is why I'm pretty sure they're so uh, aloof when it comes to what the management of Blizzard's going to wind up looking like after all this. Yeah, you know, you want to be optimistic, right? You want to say they're being acquired. Maybe we'll get some management, management uh, shakeups. You know, we'll improve the culture. But especially when it comes to the gaming industry, the, the culture of crunch when you have to get a game out and you're working, you know, double to triple the hours that are, are healthy and, you know, you're getting harassed at work. It, it's something that is all too common, especially in the gaming industry. So we're you want to hope that things will get better, uh, but only, you know, time will tell, especially with something as big as this. It's going to take years to see if there are any changes, uh, what they might be. Well, and honestly, historically, Microsoft doesn't have its the best reputation with its game developers. It had a really rocky relationship with Bungie mm -hmm. back when Bungie was developing Halo for them. Yep. So that was kind of a caustic environment there. Not nearly as bad as what Activision and Blizzard had, but, you know, it, it is. It's a, it's a high-stress environment. You know, I've worked in development environments doing application development. Game development is on a whole different level. You've got deadlines that are... Right off the bat, unrealistic deadlines that are being set by salespeople, not set by engineers, and you're driven to the point of uh, collapse by the time the end of the project rolls around. Yeah, you know, we're still seeing the effects of COVID with all this as well. You sure, know, a yeah. lot of these studios had to completely shut down and send everybody home with all their equipment, which, you know, we're seeing that with games. I mean, m you know, probably the biggest one is Halo Infinite, Microsoft's arguably biggest title in years, uh, got delayed a whole year, yeah. uh, you know. To make the game ready and to <laughs> probably come. needed to be delayed another couple of months too before <laughs> launch, but well, yeah, they're they're still staggering that content. They but they delayed it for a year and then released seventy percent of the game. Yeah, and thirty percent of it was bugged. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. When it comes to things like that, it's on as a bit of an aside. I would I would rather it just take longer, just so you know. Absolutely, have to, I'm the same way. I yeah. you know I play uh, in a game that's owned by EA now, Star Wars: The Old Republic. They had a, a major content drop that was supposed to happen right after the first of the year, and they had to push it out another month. And it's like, it's okay. I'm all right waiting for that because I've lived through content drops that weren't ready, mm -hmm. and it made the game just completely unplayable for a month or two while they went back to the drawing board and fixed it. Yeah. You know, I'd rather stay with the old content and, and live with it, but still be able to play the game mm -hmm. until it's ready to go. And that's not even, you know, the quality of the game and what you're dropping, the kind of content you're dropping is important. But giving it more time also allows the people making this content to not necessarily have to crunch and to have more time to, to work on it at a healthy pace. And I think that's a lot of the reason we're seeing the delays as well. So hopefully we'll see some, some more positive management decisions, but uh, unfortunately only time will tell on that. Um, excuse me. But another big aspect of this is Games Pass. Now, for those of you that might not know, Xbox Games Pass is basically the Netflix of gaming. It's the thing that everybody calls it. And I'm sure they're going to, they might already have that as like their official slogan, but <laughs> if they don't, they should. Um, but basically you pay a uh, set fee every month. I think if you get the Games Pass Ultimate, which includes your Xbox Live Gold, which allows you to play online, what's it, 15 a month, I think? Something like that, yeah. That's yeah. Um, but around that price, and you can basically download the library of games, which is like 100-some games, uh... Yeah, available to play. Now, you also get first-party Xbox Studio games, Day and Date, uh, Xbox Games with Gold, EA Play as well, getting a lot of EA titles in yep. there. Uh, and there's also Games Pass for PC, so you don't even have to have an Xbox <laughs> to access a lot of these things because you can get it all through Games Pass for PC, which is a recent addition, uh, but definitely a huge, uh, a huge get, which also ties into this acquisition because a lot of these games from Blizzard are primarily on PC. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, some numbers for you about Microsoft Games Pass. This comes from Tom Warren over at The Verge. Quote, Microsoft Game Pass service now has 25 million subscribers, uh, which is up from 18 million 
Microsoft reported in January of last year. So in just a year, you're adding 7 million more subscribers. And that's in a year where you acquire Bethesda, you get the EA deal through, so you can get EA Play, you get Games Pass on PC. That's all in a year, and it makes sense why they got 7 million more people on board. Sure. And that's not even accounting the the Xbox first-party studios, uh, those games that came out, like Halo, and um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. There was there was Rainbow Six, but I don't think that's... That's another big game on Games Pass. It's not an Xbox exclusive, but... Right. So you had a couple games drops as well to kind of justify those higher numbers. Uh, Xbox Games Pass is shifting how gaming companies look at revenue models. Uh, it's kind of changing the whole industry. Uh, it's it's changing it from being you pay 60 to $70 for a game the day it comes out. You have a physical disc, you play it, and that's it. Now we're kind of shifting to a more uh, ever-changing thing where you have a library of digital games that you can then download, which some people aren't for because they'd rather have that physical media. Personally, I don't mind, except for when it comes to storage. <laughs> Because I know you have, there's two different models of the newest Xbox out now. Right. There's one that has a disk drive and one that doesn't. Uh, you have the non-disk drive one. Do you ever run into storage issues with, you know, having to download everything like that? I don't. Uh, and and I have I have the internal storage. Uh, I have the external NVMe card storage. Plus, I offload a good chunk of the games to um, the slower USB drive on there. So. I've got plenty of storage is only the newest, latest, greatest games need to be played on the fastest storage. So they've provided enough options that it's manageable. And mm -hmm. I'm not too worried about that. And I download all the games anyway. I, I mean, I couldn't tell you the last time I went to a GameStop or someplace else to buy a physical piece of media for the, for the game. Yeah, absolutely. I'm the same way. I, I have a, because I download everything. The second it comes to Game Pass, I'm downloading it to play just because I love video games. And, you know, I think this is a great you know, this isn't an ad for Games Pass, but it is, I think it's the best value in gaming because if you're someone that doesn't necessarily want to commit to that $60 purchase, you can get Games Pass and have over 100 games available to play like that. Yeah. And, you know, you run into well, issues. Well, not like that. You do have to download. <laughs> yeah, them. that's what I was about to say. Yeah. yeah, there is the issue, you know, if you don't have the best internet connection uh, or if you don't have the money to shell out for an external hard drive or things like that, there are some barriers to entry there. Um, but you can still only download one game at a time and, you know, the Xbox can handle that if you're able to download it eventually. Uh, but like I was saying, this uh, Games Pass is shifting how game companies are looking at the revenue models going forward. Uh, Sony is looking to compete with its PS Now service. Uh, it is similar to Games Pass, but not nearly as effective in the marketplace. And a big reason for that is because uh, with PS Now, I don't think you can download the games. I think you have to stream them. You're streaming them, yeah, live. Which, uh, even with a good internet connection, you can tell. <laughs> yeah. Well, the latency, you can't, there's no way you can get around with the technology we have today. You can't get around latency. Yep. And latency, especially if you're playing like a first-person shooter or something like that, latency is going to kill you every time. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can get around the physics of you're trying to send a bit of data from your network all the way across the internet to some server somewhere else and might not even be your region. Um, you physically, even if you are using fiber optics all the way, you're limited by the speed of light. And there is, you know, people don't realize it, but there's this limit to the speed of light when you're trying to go across the country yeah. or when you're trying to bounce a signal off a satellite. Mm -hmm. And and talking about those those online-only services, Xbox does have xCloud, which allows you to stream games from your console to your, either your phone or a tablet or something like that. Uh, and they have made significant improvements to that in terms of dealing with latency. But still, if you're playing, like you said, a first-person shooter or a fighting game or a racing game, something that is online multiplayer, you're yeah. going to notice it regardless. Yeah, single-player games, you're usually pretty okay mm -hmm. with it, but don't try to do anything competitive in player versus player. Yeah. Uh, but Sony is looking to beef up their PSN Now service. This comes from Jonas Mackey over at Game Reactor. Uh, quote, the creator of PlayStation 4 and 5, Mark Cerny, has filed a patent via USPTO for, quote, backward compatibility through use of spoof clock, I don't know what that is, and fine-grained frequency control. So basically, you know, Sony's got some, some patents on the book for backwards compatibility. So it leads people to speculate uh, that they are going to try to incorporate some more, you know, PS3 games and PS4 games into PS Now to try to make it compete with uh, Games Pass, while also maybe throwing in your PS Plus, which is the equivalent of Xbox games or Xbox Gold, basically the online component, kind of rolling it all into one package, just like you have here with Games Pass. Do you think that would be as effective uh, as as Microsoft's Game Pass? It has the potential. I think the problem you run into is that game services is an area where PlayStation is playing catch up. Microsoft is leaps and bounds. They're they're ten years ahead of PlayStation when it comes to this this service and this ability. 
uh, Microsoft uh, abandoned, or I'm sorry, PlayStation really abandoned their backwards compatibility as a serious concern um, years ago. You know, as they were moving past the PS2, PS3, they didn't really worry about supporting backwards compatibility. That was an area that, that Microsoft really cashed in on because they knew all these people out there had this huge library of games and they were going to be angry if they couldn't play them, you know, moving forward. So Microsoft has been very good about that. And Microsoft, you know, just to talk real quickly about the technology that, that they're talking about here, the spoof clock. So the problem with the newer game systems is they run fast, right? They're newer processors. They're faster clocks on the processors. And you need all that for the computation. The problem is when you try to run an older system on a clock that fast, it either doesn't work at all or it works at a rate that you can't play that game anymore. So what they do is they try to, to clock down the processor on there so you can play it at the same speed as the old consoles. Well, Microsoft got around that by using virtual machines, which Microsoft brought in from their corporate world. So when you fire up, you know, an old Xbox 360 game, it fires up a virtual machine and it runs in that virtual machine completely self-contained in there and fully functional. So they're not doing these gimmicky type things like like PlayStation's trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that is, that is kind of a thing, right? That Xbox, when they announced that they were going to have 360 games coming to Xbox One at the time, people lost their minds. Because, oh, yeah. yeah, obviously for the reasons you're saying, people didn't want to lose all those games. You can go back and play original Xbox games now. They're, they're making them compatible. Yeah. I, I, as, a, as a lifelong Xbox and PlayStation fan, it's really, really cool to have access to those old games. Uh, although I think they, Xbox announced recently that the last batch of what's going to be backwards compatible has been announced. Uh, so we are seeing that halt. But it's still a ton of games. Yeah. And, you know, even one game would have made it, you know, over PlayStation in, in, this, in this instance. Uh, but let's get into another big aspect of this, which we kind of teased at the beginning of the show, uh, Call of Duty. Let's right? take a break before we get into that. All right. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. And we're back with Insights into Tomorrow. Today we're talking about Microsoft's gaming monopoly. Uh, so like I said uh, before, you know, I'm, I'm a little rambunctious. I thought I'd just plow right through. But, you know, we got bills to pay. Got to keep the lights on. So we had to run some ads. <laughs> but we're back. Uh, and we're going to get into talking about Call of Duty. Uh, you know, it's one of the biggest, the worthy enough that they decided to put it as part of their, their banner here for the purchase. Um, but it is Activision's probably their biggest game that they're currently publishing. Uh, once again, Call of Duty Vanguard, which is the most recent uh, addition in the franchise, was the best-selling game of 2021. Um, this comes from the NPD, or the National Purchase Diary panel. Uh, that comes from its sales report for 2021, that Call of Duty Vanguard, number one again. Which is interesting, because it was critically panned and, like, fan-panned. I don't know what you would call that demographic, but nobody liked the game. <laughs> but it was still the number one best-selling game, you know? And, it's, and that kind of speaks to why Call of Duty is such a valuable asset for now Microsoft to have in their pocket because, and I could speak of this as a Call of Duty fan that kind of hopped off the bandwagon after uh, Cold War, this the last entry. Call of Duty fans are dedicated. Yeah. and Fanatical, I would say. Yeah. And they're going to buy it regardless of what it is. People will pre-order the next Call of Duty before it's even announced what it is. Yeah. So when you acquire something like this, that's, that's guaranteed money in your pocket. And um, in a second, we'll get into, Microsoft now has a lot of these titles where the fan bases are extremely rabid. Uh, but this comes from Eddie Mo Makuch over at GameSpot.com. <laughs> That's, 
You know, it's that's a shame. Just work through the name. Yeah, that's Eddie, it. Eddie, if you're listening, I apologize. Uh, change your name though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> quote: Vanguard was December's best-selling game of December and the full year, and the series has now been the best-selling game franchise for dollar sales for 13 years in a row. How do you feel about that? Because I could not believe that statistic when I saw it. Uh, being a fan of Call of Duty for 13 years, <laughs> I could totally understand it. You know, that's the one game a year. I don't play games nearly as much as I used to, but the one game a year that I always look forward to is, is Call of Duty. Uh, and, and you know, Call of Duty is not released by just one development group either. You know, they come out each year. It's a different group that comes out with them. And it's it's funny looking at the dynamic and almost this, the personality that you get from game to game. Um, but it's a totally big sense to me that you're going to have a group of people that are that dedicated to it. Because the big fan base for Call of Duty isn't the, oh, let's just play through the scenario and be done with it, mm -hmm. campaign and be done with it. It's that online, cutthroat, super competitive, you know, prestiging 20 times, getting all the bells and whistles and all the toys on my weapons and all the colors. That's what it is. And it's, it's a, it's a reward based system that they run on that keeps people addicted. You know, it's almost like a, a like, you know, drug addiction where there's always something for you when you keep playing. It's not like you run the content and the game's over. There's such replayability with it, with the online PVP play. Yeah, and that's not even factoring in Call of Duty Warzone, right? Which dropped, what, three, four years ago? But, you know, kind of became another another Battle Royale in that Battle Royale wheelhouse that is just a cash cow for the folks over at Activision. Because, you know, it, it's difficult for any game, especially a Battle Royale, to break out and kind of make its name. But, you know, you have the big three, I would say, at this point. You have Fortnite, Apex Legends, which is also won by EA, and uh, now Call of, or Warzone. So... It's just interesting to think about like how much money just Warzone alone is bringing in, which they've already said they're going to continue that because, of course, they are. Why? Why would they why stop? Why wouldn't you? It's a, you know, it's a golden goose. Yeah. Um. But something else I wanted to mention about the Call of Duty thing is that now part of this acquisition, Microsoft now owns Major League Gaming, and I don't know for sure, but there's got to be a Call of Duty tournament with MLG, right? Oh, I'm sure there is. Yeah. So now Microsoft has all that stuff in house. <laughs> I'm not nearly that good enough to to know no. where it is or how to play it, but. <laughs> Yeah, so now Microsoft has all those, they almost have, it's like, you know, the old Paramount decision with movies back in the 30s. They have the the distribution, the, manuf what was it, distribution, manufacturing, and uh, what's the other one? Production. Production, maybe. I don't know. There's three things that you they need. They produced them, they distributed them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they have all these, oh, exhibition, that's what it is, like, oh. for movies when you go see it in theater. But now they own, like, the Xbox, I guess, would be the movie theater at this point. And that's really where that concern came from, was that you're not just looking at an EA buying up other uh development houses you're yeah. looking at the the people that bring this to your house that you play on their hardware they're now going to be a major player in producing the games themselves and locking up those games to a closed system and that's what scares a lot of people yep uh for a little bit of context here's the top five games of 2021 you have call of duty vanguard vanguard call of duty black ops cold war which was the one before vanguard Madden NFL 22, uh, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl, and Battlefield 2042. Now, there's some variation in the numbers there because I don't think this accounts for digital sales. But regardless, four out of these five games Microsoft now technically owns. Right. <laughs> and these are, you know, semi-annual titles. You know, Madden comes out every year and is another cash cow. That's, you know, you talk about rabid fan bases. Madden's one of the biggest ones out there. Yeah. And FIFA. You know, just the FIFA Ultimate Team alone is a billion-dollar industry. <laughs> Yeah. And it's just, it's insane that now Microsoft now has Call of Duty, the sports games, and just that alone could make any company rich for years, but sure. they've got, they've got everything else to pack it up. Uh, I don't well, know. And ironically, the place that I think Microsoft is going to make the most money out of this in the short term is going to be mobile. Mm -hmm. Microsoft had no uh, footprint in the mobile market itself now, and now they're going to be probably second place in, in mobile games at this point in time, just from this acquisition. That's huge. Just mm -hmm. the, the microtransactions associated with the mobile games, huge cash cow for them. Yep, because you have King with Candy Crush, and I'm sure King makes other mobile games. I'm not too familiar with them. But you also have Diablo. Diablo Immortal uh, is a huge mobile game that no one was particularly happy about when it got announced. But it might already be out or it's coming out. And when, that's When you can have games that are 
terrible games by all <laughs> accounts and they still make a fortune, you know you're doing something right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure when Diablo Immortal got announced, it was booed uh, at E3. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, that's another big mobile title coming out. You know, we're going to see. I wouldn't be surprised if we got a variation on, you know, Warcraft, the original Warcraft, like the RTS, the real time sure, strategy yeah. games, ported to mobile because, and StarCraft. I think all these things could. They're, they're, they're perfect for it. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, I would not be surprised at all. There's also Call of Duty Mobile, which is, I think, you know, it's still around, so it's pretty successful. But, you know, you're exactly right. I think we're going to see, you know, Xbox kind of maybe try to dominate this market, yeah. assuming it can compete with Tencent. Um, that's also counting xCloud, which you is, you know, can, you can play games mobily, uh, which I think is really cool technology, especially if you're someone that travels a lot. I've not had a good experience with oh, really? it. And it's, it's more because of the controls. Oh yeah. You know, it's really tough to play a console game on a tablet or a phone without having a proper controller. Yeah. That's, that's kind of been why I don't use it often as well, because I have to hook up the controller to my yeah. phone and it's like, oh, right, you've kind of lost me with that stuff. But you know, if they're, if they're going to double down on this mobile market, I could see them making, you know, a more an easier to use interface or make games specifically for mobile that you don't have to worry about translating that controller as interface. As long as Microsoft doesn't try to make phones again, we should all be okay. <laughs> I had that Microsoft phone, by the way. I wanted that thing and it was terrible. <laughs> So, yeah, I think they learned their lesson there. Uh, but we're going to take another quick break, and then we're going to come back and talk more Monopolies. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all Things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. We're back with Insights Into Tomorrow, episode 16, where we are talking about Microsoft acquiring Blizzard. Uh, so we've kind of been leading up to this this entire show, uh, the discussion of Monopoly. Uh, what does this mean for? <laughs> what does this mean, Jenny? What does this mean for Microsoft monopolizing the games industry? Should PlayStation gamers be worried that they simply won't be able to play some of their favorite franchises going forward? Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, they should not be worried at all. Sony just acquired Bungie, and that huge catalog of games that <laughs> Bungie doesn't have. Destiny Two, baby. Um. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of puzzled at the uh, Sony response to this. It was almost like a, hey, we need to look like we're still in the game here, so let's buy something. Well, it wasn't a response because these deals take months. Sony, <sighs> it's a response in general to Microsoft's, you know, acquiring Bethesda, now this. But the, the acquisition game, the land grab in general, I think, I don't think it's a direct response to this, but it is something that Sony is trying to flesh out their online presence because, you know, you think Sony, you think single player, narrative focused action, you know, adventure games you have uncharted well not anymore but you know uh last of us god of war uh all these things Spider horizon spider-man yeah all these things that are single player driven sony really doesn't have a foot in that multiplayer landscape like microsoft does with things like you know halo infinite's multiplayer which is free to play not exclusives no they're, yeah. they're banking on cross-platform licensing like call of duty and stuff like that yeah but hopefully having bungie they can kind of flesh out that landscape, not just with Destiny 2, but I think they announced another uh, IP from Bungie, uh, kind of focusing in the multiplayer world as well. Uh, but Call of Duty has been confirmed to be multi-platform for at least the next three years, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if... Do do you think we'll see a, a an Xbox-exclusive Call of Duty? Absolutely. Yeah. They, Microsoft would be stupid if they didn't. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Do you think they would try to split it up and have it be single player only on Xbox, multiplayer Warzone everywhere else, or Warzone everywhere else, multiplayer single player only on Xbox? I think you're going to see the whole thing just be on Xbox. Microsoft has very few bankable franchises that they can say are exclusives that they didn't themselves create already. 
You know, you've got Halo. You've got what else do you have? I mean, Gears of War. I, which unless they make another game is not super. They're, they, that's kind of getting long in the tooth. Thing. Yeah. Well, we're on number six. Well, five came out, but the next one would be number six. But Microsoft, Sony made their place in the gaming market with their exclusives. Mm -hmm. And they sucked up all the exclusives is the problem. When Microsoft went to, went to start doing exclusives, there was none left. Yeah. Well, I mean, that too. And like the, the focus of Microsoft has never really been on making, you know, you don't have those like. It reminds me of like the 90s and 2000s where he had mascot games like Crash Bandicoot and sure. Spyro. Sony kind of has that now with Spider-Man, Horizon Zero Dawn. You see these characters, you recognize them from PlayStation games. Microsoft pretty much only has Master Chief. <laughs> right. I mean, you can count Marcus Phoenix and, and now Kate, uh, I forget her last name, from from Gears of War. Uh, those are iconic characters, but they're not nearly as as beloved and as current as as a lot of your PlayStation uh, single party players or yeah. characters. So seeing Call of Duty go exclusive to Microsoft I think is a no-brainer. Are we going to get a Call of Duty Halo crossover? Uh, God, I hope not. <laughs> I insane. mean it's it's possible given the direction that they've gone with some of the Call of Duty stories. Yeah. Um I wouldn't put it past them if they think they can make money on it. I think I think us arguing whether or not Microsoft acquiring Blizzard Activision is a monopolistic uh, move is difficult when they're claiming they're solidly claiming the third place slot. Yeah. It's really hard to say you're a monopoly when you're third place. Yeah. It's just, I think the biggest thing that, that frightens people and why they cry monopoly is because the, the independent game studio landscape is, is dwindling yeah. quickly. And it, you, you wonder if there's going to come a day where, everything is either a Sony Studios or an Xbox Studios game, and if we're just going to lose that independent scene altogether. Well, you will, but it's one of those things that's self-sustaining because I can go into business for myself, I can take out a $100,000 loan, start a studio, run it for three years, come up with something that's marketable, and then get a 100-time return on my investment and get bought out. So just as, a, as an entrepreneurial injector, it, those independent organizations are still going to continue going on there if for no other reason than to be targeted for buyouts. Yeah. You know, the more I think about it, it is a lot like movies where you had, you know, early movies were not owned by anybody, but then you had big studios like Warner brothers and others. And then eventually that studio system was torn down and that's why you get more independent films like in the sixties and seventies. Are we going to see this with gaming where, you know, these studios buy up everybody. We get these, you know, a decade or two of all these exclusive console exclusive games. And then do we have a, you know, a kind of consumer pushback against that where we'll go back to more independent publishers? Or do you think we'll, we'll settle into this studio, you know, grab up, uh, grab a phone. The market never really allows the polarizing effect of one or two companies to run things. It, the, the corporate industries tends to, um, migrate in that direction. I mean, even if you look at like uh, retail, for instance, so everybody vilified uh, Walmart because they, they came into every town and they killed all the small, small mom and pop shops. And then what happened after that? Then Amazon showed up and Amazon's now killing Walmart. Mm -hmm. So now all the small mom and pop shops are like, well, you got to support your local businesses. So now there's a big push for all the local businesses, all your little bookstores and everything else. So the market is going to regulate itself more than the government is. The government's going to try and regulate it for for purposes of, you know, tax revenue and and so forth, but the market doesn't sustain monopolies very well. Yeah. Uh, dialing it back a bit by owning all these uh, these yearly releases, the ones we hit on earlier, the Maddens, the Call of Duties, the Fifas. Does Microsoft stifle competition? Because if you're if you're someone that is a casual gamer, right, and you only buy one game a year, and that game is Call of Duty, and you own a PlayStation, you know, is this something that Microsoft, whether it's you know not a real monopoly, not a total monopoly, are there some some issues with it? Well, the competition does not survive off of those guys that buy one game a year, right? You know, the competition is, is, is spurred on by market growth. It's spurred on by market activity. And what you find now, the reason so many of these acquisitions are happening is because you have so many independent companies that put out that one gem. And everybody loves that for, for six months and it makes a fortune. Well, and then you see someone like Microsoft, go gobble them up. Mm-hmm. It's not going to stop those guys from producing that. You're still going to have all these small 
studios and, and individual efforts that are going to be putting out those brainstorms that you don't get that level of innovation from a corporation like a Microsoft or a Sony. You just don't get that kind of innovative design and, and out-of-the-box thinking. Um, this, this sort of stuff has been happening since the 1980s and, and through the 90s where you get a couple of guys that start like, you've probably heard of Sid Meier's, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Civilization, Pirates. He started, it was a two-man company he started. And they got huge. Then they, and they were popular. And then when when they got bought out, they created Microprose. And when, when Microprose wound up getting bought out, he went and started another studio. And when that got bought out for Axis, he went and started. So you're not going to stop people like that who, who can't, I don't want to say can't operate in a corporate culture, but they don't thrive in a corporate culture. They mm. thrive in that small incubator type of environment. And they're going to keep going. They're they're going to they're going to build what they want. They'll sell it off. They'll build the next great thing. They'll sell it off. They'll build the next great thing. And there's hundreds of people like that that are out there in in multiple industries, not just the game industry. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, I, it was something I was worried about because I think that just like with movies, again, bringing it back again, you have to have the independent element, right? Because if you're if everything is studio mandated, it it stifles creativity Absolutely. at the very least. Uh, so you know. I do, I do agree with you that I, I think we'll see that independent scene will still be there, and it's just a matter of you know when they make it big and get bought by Sony or Microsoft. Everybody wants you know the old saying in in the movies: everyone wants their fifteen minutes of fame. Well, everybody wants their big break. Everyone wants their buyout here, so everyone's still going to keep building the stuff independently. Yeah, there was an example I, I thought of while you were making that comparison. Drinkbox Studios, they made a game called Guacamelee and Guacamelee 2. Side-scrolling, pla uh, platforming action game. Really creative, really fun. Then they got bought by Microsoft, and they recently had a game come out called Nobody Saves the World, which was day and date on Games Pass. But playing that game, you know, you worry a little bit that you're going to lose some of the independent uh, charm, but they didn't. And and so, you know, as long as Microsoft, if they're going to, you know, Microsoft and Sony, if they're going to buy these studios, if they can kind of remain hands off and still let these guys work and but just have it be, you know, maybe a console exclusive if it needs to be at sure. the end of the day. Well, Bungie's a great example. Bungie was a fantastic small independent group when Microsoft went to them with Halo. They did a fantastic job with Halo, knocked it out of the park. Microsoft bought them, ran them for a little bit, stifled their innovation, and then they wound up breaking it off again as an independent group. Now they're getting bought by Sony, so, you know, some people don't learn their lessons, I guess. Well, it's also important to note that they were owned by Activision for, like, two years, for, I don't know, I forget how long, but they were owned until 2019 by Activision, which was also a terrible relationship that, right. that they were treated terribly with, and the fans hated it, and Bungie hated it, and I'm pretty sure Activision hated it. It was a bad time all around. Yeah. Uh, yeah but Bungie know. can't catch a break. Bioware, same thing. Bioware had had a huge fan base of, of Rabbit fans because of the philosophy that the owners had. The, the quality of the product that they put out, they get acquired by EA. EA basically waters the entire thing down, slaps their little formula for development on there, and it's a, it's it's just a clone of what EA is now. Yeah, yeah. EA, we could probably do a whole other episode on EA, but uh, <laughs> they have similar corporate issues. Uh, but uh, but yeah, again, going back to Microsoft and the monopoly. Microsoft, of course, we talked about it on a previous episode. Uh, they faced criticism back in the '90s for its antitrust practices. Are they heading down a similar path uh, from McKenna Kelly over at The Verge? Uh, quote, and this gets into some of the details about the FTC. The Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission launched a joint effort to modernize antitrust enforcement, seeking comment on how the agencies can apply current law in cases against tech companies like Meta, which is formerly uh, Facebook, and Google. Uh, the announcement came at a joint press conference from FTC Chair Lena Khan and Justice Department Antitrust Chief Jonathan Cantor, who described the move as a wide-ranging enforcement modernization effort. So we did an episode a while back about tech companies and their monopolies, and I think this is just another nail in the coffin of, of the FTC kind of getting wise to it and kind of changing legislation to to better combat these, these deals. How do, what do you think about that? Well, and I think the problem you run into here is it's a change of administration. It's a new... FTC that has to kind of make a splash here that it's anti-monopolistic. So they need an example, right? So the advantage that Microsoft has though, is they're not in the center of the, you know, the regulatory sniper rifle at this point in time, you've got two big companies out there that have really got everybody else's attention. 
So I think it's more a matter of timing. I think if Microsoft plays this smart, they don't rush this. They wait for Khan to get caught up in either a meta mm -hmm. uh, witch hunt or a, a Google witch hunt and go after them. And I think the FTCs, the Biden administration is looking for a win, right? And if the, the, Big guys out there to get that win on aren't Microsoft. They're Meta and, and Google. So if they lock horns with one of them first, Microsoft will be able to get through without any, any real challenges, I think. Yeah, definitely. And, and Meta's already kind of taken a couple hits <laughs> recently. They're not doing themselves any favors. No, it seems like every week we're getting... They feel like the worst month ever. I, well, the fact that they even changed the name. I mean, that was just such a blatant attempt to put lipstick on a pig there and hope the government didn't recognize you're the same evil company yeah uh, what they have uh, their first mark or quarter where they lost uh users yeah their revenue is down like they're just falling apart zuckerberg lost 20 billion dollars on paper in one day yeah i so you're right if they're, if they're looking for someone to make an example out of it seems like meta might be the better target <laughs> well and that's the thing not even from a I, you know, I hate to bring politics into this, but it's not even just from a, a monopolistic standpoint. Meta has a reputation from a perspective of influencing politics mm -hmm. and in a negative way for Democrats. And when you're facing a Democratic administration who needs a win, you've made yourself a very easy target at that point. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that was it makes them certainly a like you said, a much bigger target. Uh, while the announcement spans markets, it specifically – this goes back to the FTC, uh, the task force they're putting together. It specifically questions how regulators should approach merger approval in digital markets, uh, potentially setting new legal standards around data aggregation, uh, interoperability. That's a fun there one to say. Uh, I was going to say interpolarity, but that doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Uh, and market consolidation that can affect competition. So it's really – we're seeing a bit of a – a really unprecedented time for when it comes to these kind of laws because they they have to change them for the digital market. It's a uh, it's it makes you wonder where these things will go in say twenty years. And the problem that you have is government is the wheels of government are notoriously slow. They do not keep up with technology. They do not keep even from a medical standpoint. Government regulation does not keep up with advances in technology, and they never it never will. Uh, because the bureaucracy itself doesn't allow it. You know, what What would take a development company, you know, six months to put out a, a, a new piece of technology, it would take the government four years to catch up to that between legislation and debates and subcommittees and all that stuff. So for the government itself to be reactionary in situations like this is very dangerous from a regulatory standpoint. What the government needs to do is stop looking at this from a per company standpoint and look at it from an impact to the market, an impact to the country and the citizens and everything else. Because only then can you react in a way that is slow but effective. Um, and I think what you run into is the reaction that you get now is it's, oh, well, these guys are bad, so we have to do something about them. Mm -hmm. And legislation is never going to keep up with that. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because we talk about how slow government moves, but these tech companies move lightning fast yep. in terms of, you know, whether it be making acquisitions like this or by expanding their, their spheres of influence. So it's it's almost like it's, it's oil and water in terms of how these, these two entities operate and, you know, how does that impact legislation and how does that impact the amount of power that these tech companies are able to, to uh, you know, consolidate and aggregate. Um, but, you know, as we're coming to the end of the show, do you think this merger is going to go through? I think without a doubt it's going to go through, yes. And do you think that it will – do you think this will be a footnote in the FTC's policy going forward when it comes to these kind of mergers? I don't think it's really going to get much scrutiny from the FTC. It's not a questionable deal. Uh, we already talked about them becoming third. If they, be, if they were number one after this deal, mm -hmm. I could see it getting scrutiny. You can't accuse someone of being monopolistic when you're number three in the market. It, yeah. it just it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, if the merger, you know, stepping out of the game industry for for a moment, if the merger between T-Mobile and Sprint could go through because they were third place and that was part of the justification for that, then you already have a precedent set for it. So there's very little chance that it's going to get blocked. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. I think it will go through. And, you know, 
you were kind of at that stage where all this news broke and it was a, it was a crazy month of hearing the the headlines and, and what this means. But we're kind of at a point where now we kind of just hurry up and wait <laughs> yeah. where yeah. we, you know, we see because this is going to these things take years to figure out what, what's the real question is, what are things going to look like in, in five to 10 years for Microsoft and for Blizzard? And that's where you have to look, because even after this deal signed, nothing's going to happen for three to four years. Um, five years from now, I think you're going to find Xbox is going to be. Uh, far more dominant in the gaming scene. You know, PlayStation has traditionally always beat out Xbox as far as console sales and game sales. And I think if if Microsoft doesn't come out on top, it's going to be a lot closer than it was. Mm. Um, but the other thing you have to keep in mind is a lot of the reason why Microsoft isn't first is Microsoft tends to shoot themselves in the foot from a technology standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, you know, just the fact that they can't consistently name their consoles <laughs> really confuses the hell out of people. It's a branding issue, right? <laughs> that it, it really is. Every time they come out with a new console, they try to reinvent themselves, and it, it backfires every single time. Yeah. So Microsoft has their own flurry of mistakes that they continuously make over and over again that really impede their ability to be dominant. Mm -hmm. Buying their way to dominance is a new strategy. But I don't know if it's necessarily going to work because you got the same people making the same mistakes. Yeah. I mean, you know, we talk about that strategy of buying and it, it almost creates the image of Microsoft setting up all these dominoes that they're just waiting to push down. You know, because we have the Bethesda acquisition, uh, Elder Scrolls 6, a big game from Bethesda, Starfield. I believe Starfield was confirmed to be an Xbox exclusive. So, again, we go back to that five to ten year you know, benchmark is Microsoft going to have a, a decade where they're just releasing, you know, hit title after hit title, which people kind of think that they were going to do now with Halo, but that was kind of all they did. <laughs> and and that's the thing you can, just because you have a, an exclusive doesn't mean people are going to want to play it. Yeah. And that's the problem you run into. <laughs> yeah. And then you get the opposite of that with Sony where people are going to play those games because there's a, a level of quality that yes. is pretty much unmatched. Yes. And Microsoft, if, if nothing else has an, infamous reputation of putting out poor quality uh, code, whether it's operating systems, yeah. uh, Microsoft Office, video game, doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, when you, and they just, this was another folly of their marketing department, they mark the um, uh, Red Ring of Death issue from the Xbox mm. 360 by selling t-shirts with the Red Ring of Death. Mm. Now, if you haven't been in the gaming industry for a while, the Red Ring of Death was when the office, the uh, office, right? <laughs> the Xbox 360 came out. They had a hardware issue, a fundamental hardware issue that was causing the little Xbox power ring to turn red and the game system basically became useless. Yep. And they stumbled on replacing that. It turned out, actually, it turned out it was, it was bad solder. Mm. So they were using uh, cold solder that was too fragile. So the, the solder points, just from the motion of the fans and moving the thing around, would cause the solder points to break. So they went back to the manufacturing process and they injected more, um, I think it was more lead or something, into the copper itself to soften the copper up. Well, and then what happened was as you played the game over a period of time, the game system would heat up to the point that it would melt the solder mm. and you'd get the problem again. So they really, for the first two years of the 360, they really flubbed the whole thing until they fixed their manufacturing issues. The fact that they're going to mark the release of the 360 by using the Red Ring of Death on a, a logo. Yeah. Is just idiotic. Like, why would you do that? Yeah, it's like trying to claim something, right, and to make it better. But I don't think I think the the memories that's the wound is still too too exposed exactly uh, to be doing things like that. I mean, now we're seeing that they don't have nearly as poor of a launch with the Xbox Series X and S. Uh, there is the chip shortage, which is affecting everything. Um, but well, I would, but the problem that you run into is so you want to buy an Xbox Series S. Well, do you need to buy an Xbox One S? Because that's what a lot of people wound up doing and not yep. getting what they wanted. Yep. So it's almost like Microsoft is deliberately confusing their marketing now and having people buy stuff that they don't want. Yeah, it's it's definitely a, a branding issue overall. How difficult is it? Xbox One, Xbox Two, Xbox... 
hey, you know what? Sony did that. And nobody confuses their consoles, do they? It's true. Well, that, you also get into the whole discussion of what kind of company Microsoft wants to be. Because with the Xbox One, they wanted it to be a multimedia device. Right. And Sony was never, they didn't care about that. I mean, they kind of tried it with the PS3, but it was still called the PlayStation 3. Exactly. Ultimately, it's there to play video games, which I think... Xbox is definitely going back to that with the Xbox Series X because you lost the uh, bypass for your cable. That's not that's no longer a feature. Right. And so I think they're definitely returning to their, I guess, quote unquote roots. They're uh, building a game system. Yeah. And Congratulations, it's, guys. I mean, the Series X is on par with uh, something you can get on PC, right? In terms of specs, not uh, like high end. From a hardware standpoint, yeah. Yeah. So they're they're going back to the the drawing board and the basics, hopefully, and and you know. We'll see the ramifications of the, the COVID-19 pandemic and that chip shortage for years uh, in terms of actually being able to get your hands on these consoles. Um, but I think that, you know, Microsoft is almost stepping past that with things like xCloud. You know, they continue to dump money into that. Yeah, I could totally see in, in a decade, maybe, you know, the next Xbox isn't. Uh, you know, it isn't a box. It's a like a fire stick that you just stick into your TV. Yeah, that's hard to do. Google tried to do that, and it, Google Stadia They're just, just early. didn't take off with it. Yeah, Ax- uh, Amazon's doing it too with uh, Luna. Yeah, uh, you know, I think the technology just isn't there yet, right? But when it gets there, the, you know, the audience isn't ready for that yet. That's too. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's it's a very hard sell to be like, well, there's no box. Well, how do right. I? What do I do with this? Here, here's five hundred dollars yeah. and a stick. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little bit of buyer's remorse there. Yeah. Uh, well, and the problem that, you know, not to go off topic too far here, but the problem that Google had was you would buy games through Google Stadia, but you never own the rights to the games. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So you'd pay full price for the game and it was their game. You were really just borrowing yeah. it for 50 bucks or that, 60 bucks. That was where Stadia lost me. Yeah. Uh, but we will monitor this going forward. We'll see uh, when this acquisition goes through, what's going to happen with it. Uh, but that's going to wrap up today's episode of Insights into Things. Uh, of course, I'll hit the show plugs for you again. You can always subscribe to everything on every platform, everywhere. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, Pandora. Uh, but we also you know, want to hear what your thoughts are. What did you think about this acquisition? How do you feel about it? Even if you're not a gamer, in terms of a tech acquisition, how do you feel about it? You can email us at comments at Insights Into Things. We're on Twitter at Insights underscore Things. Uh, we stream on Twitch. Twitch.tv slash insights into things. And if you have Amazon Prime, that means you do have Twitch Prime and you can give us that free Prime stuff. It really helps us out. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast, Instagram at insights into things. And finally, all this information and so much more at insights into things.com. That's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for listening and have a wonderful rest of your day.